Now that you've got some idea of what goes into the Renaissance, why it starts in Italy, let's start with Italian Renaissance motifs. So those most common decorative forms that we tend to see in the Italian Renaissance. Now, some of these will be repeats because of course they're taking from previous societies. For example, we see the return of classical and Islamic motifs. Now, this is going to be important for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Renaissance is looking back at the Greeks and the Romans for inspiration. So being surrounded, especially in Italy, by Roman ruins, they're going to use some of their ideas, such as the use of a canthus uh, or that sort of floral vine work that we tend to see. We will also see them use Islamic motifs. And as I said earlier in another video, that's because Islam has been run out of Granada. In other words, Islam has been removed from Spain by 1492. And that means that all of those ideas, when it comes back, back to Italy will come into the decorative schemes. Why is it coming back? Because all of the books from Islam are going to either Paris or to Italy. Most of them are going to Italy. And of course, some of the decorative ideas will follow them. So we get this return of the classical and Islamic. We will also see the use of a roundel or a tondo, depending on what you're dealing with. Now, this is simply a circular work of art. It could be a painting, like on the left, uh, which is a tondo by Michelangelo of the Holy Family. Or you could see something more sculptural, like on the right. And that is the sort of thing that will be mounted into a wall. It's generally going to be terracotta or some other ceramic form. And then what you're looking at are glazes, white, blue, and then the floral around the outside. Either way, these are very, very common. You're going to see them a lot. Or San Michel is full of them. That's a major church in Florence. We'll also see the use of the colonnette. Now, this is basically a small, slender column, usually used in a decorative form. And it could be used architecturally, or we'll see it on furniture. Here we see it on furniture, in this case, uh, what appears to be a cupboard of some form and it's used as a corner decoration, but we also see it architecturally in churches where they have compound columns and they're trying to make it look a little more aesthetically pleasing. So they'll use the colonnette. Of course, these columns are not actually supporting any weight. They're simply blocking your view of the much larger column behind. Then we see the Renaissance grotesque, and these tend to be fanciful murals or sculptural decoration, which are mixing a number of different forms. We send, tend to see plants, animals, and human forms. And the grotesque is something that we've seen before, uh, an idea that comes out of the Romanesque, but the Italians are going to really attach themselves to it, and it gives the artist the ability to really say a lot with imagery. Most of this is generally metaphorical, so these are understood to be certain people. In this case, with the laurel, I would say that that is a personification of victory, but I'm not the artist. In the center of it is a cartouche, which is something we will get to in a minute. Uh, and these will take on numerous forms. They are getting them frequently from Greek and Roman tombs and Greek and Roman paintings. Of course, this is a grotesque form. You might also see it as style three of the wall painting in Pompeii, style, a mix of style two and style three. And that image from Pompeii is very similar to the grotesques that we see coming out of the Renaissance. So they're looking directly back at Pompeii, which is of course being heavily excavated at the time and giving them a lot of ideas. Those frescoes in Pompeii very unusually are very well preserved and that's because of the volcanic ash. Then we have Puti. These are just irritating if you really study the Renaissance, but it's basically a nude child figure, usually with wings, and it comes from the classical world. Now, in the classical world, it meant a personification of love or eros. Now, the puti, when we get to Italian painting in the Renaissance, takes on the idea of cherubim. 
Cherubim refers to angels, a specific form of angel. Now, this form of angel, according to the Bible, is a sort of thing that you can't look at. It's horrific. You will burst into flames should you ever see it. In the Renaissance, that's translated into a winged baby figure because, well, that's a lot nicer to look at than certain death. Then we have the trophy. Now, the trophy motif celebrates victory, and this actually comes from the Greeks. Now, the ancient Greeks, when they won a major victory, would put together the armor of the enemy and display it. Basically, hey, look, we were victorious over these people. These trophies are based on that principle, based on that idea. And you'll see these sculpted groups of weapons, armor, etc. And it's always a symbol of of victory in some way. It may be that someone holds an office. You see these, for example, sometimes in the Vatican, referring to the fact that the Pope was victorious becoming the Pope or triumphant in becoming the voice of God. Then we have the cartouche. And this is an elaborate, often scrolled framing device that becomes integral in ornamental features. Now, what you see is sometimes the cartouche has nothing in the middle. You simply see sort of a pillow or a shield in the center. Other times, something will be presented, maybe a relief sculpture, maybe a name or a monogram. And either way, uh, it's kind of read the same way. It's basically a framing device. Sometimes it's used decoratively, and sometimes it's used to make a statement. That's where you would see a relief carving, a monogram, a name, etc. in the middle. Then we see the three ages of man. It's called the three ages of man, but of course there are the three ages of women as well. This is an artistic idea. On the left, you see Titian's three ages of man, but a lot of artists will work with this. And the idea is that you're able as an artist to depict a human being as a youth, an adult, and an old man. Or in the case of our women over here on the right, a maiden, an old lady, and my grandmother. Um, so it's the same basic principle. The idea that I can capture age, that I understand age, and not necessarily that I can artificially age someone, but that I can capture those features because artistically, depicting youth is really easy. Most young people don't have a lot of features. The skin is all pulled fairly tight. Uh, everything kind of falls into line. Most of you look fairly similar. As you get older, though, you look at your grandparents, there's a lot more detail to deal with. You need to deal with wrinkles and age spots and everything else. And of course, if you try and draw your grandparents, you'll notice that if you get those wrinkles even a little wrong, it's not your grandparents anymore. So it's a show of artistic skill. Then we have Gadruning. And this is a decorative motif, which consisted of convex curves in a series. It, it's a really broad definition, and that's because it's a really broad idea. Here on furniture, we see these convex curves uh, coming down, almost dripping down on this molding. But here we see the same thing kind of going up on what would be uh, creamer or something along those lines. So it can take on a number of different forms, but it's always going to have some kind of convex curve form. So it's not a series of lines as such, but a series of forms. Uh, here we see what is clearly a positive form of the large curved surface, and then we see this scoop in between, which separates them. And that's really going to be a hallmark of Gadruning. 